Thank you, Joe. And thank you all, Boilers, for coming out for my wife's birthday. Happy birthday, Ailey. Um, uh, I brought with me this afternoon a Petri dish, and it reminds me of my seventh grade biology class where we would have agar in the Petri dish, and we would have some bacteria grow on it, and after a while, as the colony expanded, it would run out of resources. And today, I put in the middle of this Petri dish a picture of our globe, which a colleague of mine drew, and I wonder, is our globe a Petri dish and humans just bacteria that are about to run out of resources? And we've worried about this um, at least since 1798 when Thomas Malthus gave economics the moniker of the dismal science because he pointed out the population was growing rapidly and food production wasn't growing as rapidly. And so he was worried that we were bacteria that were just going to run out of resources in our Petri dish we call the globe. And so one might wonder, uh, in Malthus's age, there was a billion people on the planet. And today we have seven billion people on the planet. And you might wonder where we're headed. And there are experts at the United Nations that project out population. And there's essentially two things that decide how many people are going to be on the planet. One is how long we live. And fortunately, everybody's living longer. That's a unequivocally pretty good thing. And the second thing is that... Uh, it depends on how many children women have. It's, the future is in our women's hands. And they get to decide how many children they have. And if they have two, they replace them and their partner. And if they have fewer than that, population declines. And if we have more than that, population grows. And if you look at the UN projections for population, if we stay at the fertility rate we're at, the growth will be exponential. And by 2100, we'll have 25 billion people on the planet. But it's more realistic because as we get wealthier, people have fewer children. We choose to have fewer kids. And so the UN has a more realistic projection in terms of uh, just under replacement, right at replacement, and just above replacement. And if we're at replacement, we'll have about 10 billion people on the planet by 2100. So we're not really bacteria because we all kind of get it that uh, the Petri dish is limited in size. So but what about the Petri dish? Do we have enough resources? And at least as long as land-grant universities have been around, we've been addressing this issue. So Dr. Beal and Dr. Jones, they created hybrid corn that has increased the productivity of land here in Indiana four times over since 1930. And Dr. Burlog, he created wheat varieties that some people claim saved a billion people from famine. And as a result, he won a Nobel Peace Prize and he took the money that he won from that Peace Prize and he created what some believe, what some term as the Nobel Prize in Agriculture. And it's more formally known as the World Food Prize. And here at Purdue, we have two people that have won the World Food Prize. Dr. Nelson and Dr. Gabisa Jetta have both won the World Food Prize. So land-grant universities have worked to tackle the problem of making sure we don't run out of resources in this Petri dish. And actually, the United Nations Food and Ag Organization, the FAO, suggests that we grow enough food for every person on the planet to have 2,700 calories every day. And that's plenty of food for a person to be able to sustain a healthy lifestyle. And that's a pretty amazing achievement when you consider we've gone from a billion people 200 years ago to 7 billion people today. But what about the future? What are we going to do as we add 2 or 3 billion people? And even more troublesome is why we let 800 million people go hungry every day right now. And I think there's at least three issues that we need to think about. Waste, distribution, and where people are and can they afford food. The first one is some low-hanging fruit. And I know not everybody in the crowd is from the College of Agriculture, so you might not be familiar with low-hanging fruit, so I brought an illustration. <laughs> Here at the bottom of the picture is the low-hanging fruit, and at the top is the high-hanging fruit, and for a short guy like me, picking that fruit at the top can be uh, hard to do. So let's start with the low-hanging fruit, and let's think about waste. This is a picture of the food pipeline that we have, and all along the pipeline, there's opportunities for food waste. And uh, reduce some... We have the agricultural producer and reduce some processing and some packaging and some storage and some retail. And there's some opportunities for waste along there, and it gets to the consumer. But the truth is, here in the United States and in developed countries around the world, we waste more food at home than we do in the food pipeline. If you think about your uh, grocery, or if you think about your refrigerator drawer, when was the last time you cleaned that out? Hopefully you do it before you go on spring break, right? 
And we waste about 30% of the food that we take home with us, which is a pretty big portion. And if you think about it, we eat roughly two kilograms a day. And so we eat just a little bit more than 700 kilograms a year. And we actually have enough food produced to have 1,000 kilograms. So we waste about 30% of it. And that's also true in the less developed countries. But you can bet those folks who don't have as much income, they don't waste it at home. So we waste 30% of our food at home. They waste it along the chain because they don't have the technology to get the food from the producer to the consumer without some food loss. And they had some problems in Africa because they grow a lot of cow peas and consume a lot of cow peas. And they would have weevils and pests that would get in the cow peas and eat them before uh, they could. And so we'd waste about a third of the cow peas. So researchers worked on, they invented this PICS bag, an economical way to essentially have eliminated all the waste from the we weevils. And you can maybe see it says ICS stands for improved cow pea storage. Does anybody know what the P stands for? Purdue University, researchers here, working not only to improve our yields and our food supply, but also make sure it gets to people that can consume it. The second thing we want to think about is getting the food from where it's grown to where people need it. In the United States, we grow a lot of food in the Midwest. We have a lot of people on the coast that consume it. And we have the infrastructure in terms of railways, waterways, and roadways that get that food to them. And you can see in the map on your left that the railway density is great, and it gets food out to the coast. And in a bit of serendipity, the Mississippi runs right down the breadbasket and allows us to get our uh, products out to the global marketplace relatively efficiently. And our, and our highways, potholes from the polar vortex notwithstanding, are pretty amazing compared to the rest of the world. If you look at Brazil, a country who's rapidly grown their agricultural production and is one of the biggest competitors against American agricultural producers, they've had a, a, a tremendous amount of increase and actually grow more soybeans than we do now. And about a third of those soybeans are grown in the Mato Grosso region that you can see in yellow here. But you can see the railroads don't get there. And you might say, well, what about the waterways? They've got the Amazon. The Amazon is in the northern part of Brazil and doesn't reach to Mato Grosso. And if you look at the roadways, their infrastructure is so poor that it actually costs twice to get soybeans from Brazil, Mato Grosso, to Shanghai, China, than it does from Iowa, even though they're roughly the same distance. So distribution is important, and we've got to get food from where it's grown to where people are. So where are people going to be? This is a map that the National Geographic did as we just passed 7 billion people. The black dots represent where the population was in 1960. The white dots represent growth since then until 2010. And you can see in China and India, they've had substantial growth. In the United States and the Americas, we've had moderate growth. In Europe, very little growth. And in Africa, they've had some growth. They've, folks are getting wealthier. They're living longer. They haven't slowed down their fertility rates yet. And you can see that their population is roughly similar to what we have in the entire Western Hemisphere. So I'm going to switch to the next graph. It's going to be very similar, same story. Black dots are 1960, white dots are growth since then. But we're going to look at GDP, or people's ability to consume products. And I want you to keep your eye on Africa. Watch that continent. Where did it go? We have uh, China and India with a lot of white dots. They've had substantial growth since 1960. United States and the Americas, moderate growth. Europe, less growth than we've had. But in Africa, they've had some growth, but it's not enough to keep up with their population growth. And if we think about where the people are going to be, we've got to worry, are they growing enough food? So this data is from gapminder.com, which is a data visualization website. And they want you to look at data in innovative ways. And on the vertical axis, I've put total agricultural production in that country's borders. And on the horizontal axis, I've put wealth per person in that country. The size of the bubble, re bubble represents their total population. So China at the very top in red is a big bubble because it's the biggest country. And that blue dot that's in, in the middle unlabeled, that's India, because they have the second largest population. And then we have the United States in yellow. And down at the bottom, you can see Nigeria. And you'll want to keep your eye on it because the UN projects by 2050, Nigeria will be neck and neck with the United States for the third largest population in the country. So let's see what happens as we move from 1960 to 2005. You can see China starts way down in the lower uh, left of the graph, and it grows very rapidly. So it's increasing food production fast, and it's growing its wealth. The United States bounces around a little bit. That's the 1980s and some droughts we had. But we've had some pretty good growth. So I'm isolating now the growth in China, and it's been great. They've had amazing gains. 
and you can look at the United States, we started out a little bit ahead and our gains are more moderate. But if we go to Nigeria, it's hard to make them out because they're down there with those other countries, even though they're big, they've had some moderate gains in income, but their food production hasn't kept up. And we have to wonder, a country that's already a net food importer, what does that mean for their stability and their ability to be able to have access to the food they need? So you say those are some really great statistics, that's interesting, we can reduce waste, we can improve distribution, we can make sure people are participants in the global economy, but why should I care about feeding all these people? What do I care about it, Mike? Well, the truth is, no matter what your religious background is, your religion exhorts you to feed the poor, whether you're Hindu, Buddhist, or Christian, they demand that you feed the poor. And in the Quran, it says, only for the sake of Allah do I feed you, and I expect nothing in return, not even a thanks. And even if you're not a religious person, that's okay, because the humanists among us understand that feeding people is the most basic need. And Article 25 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights tells us people should have access to a safe and abundant food supply. And nobody can achieve anything without having met their basic needs for food, water, and shelter. And so we've got a Petri dish that has plenty for all. And it's time that we make sure everybody gets some because they're not bacteria, they're humans.